Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for our third presentation of today through Crescon Asia. Um, it's great to see so many of you um, coming on, and some of you may have already seen um, the presentations that have gone before, and you may be joining us uh, for the next two presentations after this one. But we are concentrating on this presentation at the moment, and uh, shortly I shall be introducing Sven Schleier, um, who will be... Um, um, talking to us with regards intercepting network communication of mobile apps. And Sven's from F-Secure in Singapore. So just before I hand over to him, there is a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to put in any questions into the question pane um, so you don't forget them. You can put them in throughout the presentation and we'll get those asked for you at the end. Um, so please do get those in for Sven while you've got him here. So um, I am going to stop talking now and I'm going to hand over to Sven. So over to you. OK, perfect. Thank you, Debbie. And hello, everybody. And thanks for joining my session today about intercepting mobile app network traffic um, for mobile apps. So let me start the presentation and then we can directly dive in. Um, so first, just very briefly about myself. So my name is Sven. Um, I'm the technical director at F-Secure, as Debbie was already saying, working here in sunny Singapore. And um, I already had quite a few um, roles in the industry from Unix administrator to penetration tester, of course, to also security architect um, for development projects that are about web and mobile. So we're supporting them um, during the whole SDLC. And uh, why I'm here today is also because one of the things is that I'm um, one of the project leaders together with Carlos Holguera of the OWASP Mobile Security Testing Guide and also the OWASP Mobile AppSec Verification Standard. And as part of this, um, I will be sharing with you a few insights in how you can intercept mobile app network traffic. Occasionally, I also do some blogging on the URL here below. And um, this is also exactly where this talk is referring to. So um, I was making a blog post earlier this year and I was ending up with the ultimate decision tree for mobile app network um, testing, which you can see here on the right side. And the thing is that many times during mobile app pen testing and how to intercept network traffic, um, I came across a lot of situations that were a bit tricky sometimes to solve. And I always wanted to summarize everything and also share with others. So that's how I came up with this um, decision tree that should help as a guidance for everybody who wants to do mobile app network testing. So I will not go into detail into this decision tree, um, but cover the interesting edge cases around it and some ticks, some tips and tricks um, that you should be aware of in order to get started with the penetration test for mobile apps. So um, the examples that I will be showing today will be mainly about iOS, simply because there is a lot of information out there for Android and for iOS, the information is usually um, a bit limited. So that's why we are focusing today purely, no, not purely, mainly on iOS. There will also be one example for Android later. So the usual setup when you're doing um, mobile app testing, so we stick now with iOS, but it, it is of course the same for Android, is very similar flow like when you're testing for a web application. Of course, you would need to configure um, your iOS device or Android device to work with Burp, meaning your Burp suite would need to listen um, on the external interface you're configuring this IP and port in your proxy settings in your iOS device. Obviously, you would need to install the certificate authority or CA from Burp into the trust store of the iOS device so that the iOS device is trusting um, the certificates that are generated on the fly by your interception proxy, which might be Burp or also OWASP SAP. And once you have done this, which is, of course, all very similar to web app testing, happy hacking because everything should be working. So usually you might think case closed, and this is the setup, and now this should be working for everything. But um, I will show you now a few edge cases on where this might not be um, working out of the box and how you can tackle then also these um, challenges. So as I was saying, there are no different scenarios when you're testing um, mobile app, uh, mobile apps. 
And this will not be working all the time that I've just shown you. The documentation is, of course, great from Portswigger, but there are several scenarios um, that you would need to tackle. And one of the things is, for example, that you might not be able or even not allowed to connect your iOS device to the Wi-Fi. There might be some restrictions, some might be technical, some might be because of policies. Um, then there might be apps that are ignoring the system proxy. So this means you're setting the proxy, but you're still not able to intercept um, the network communication from the mobile app. So this happens and we would need to find a way to intercept it nevertheless. And last but not least, not every mobile app is actually um, relying on HTTP protocol. So we might have situations where we might need to intercept non-HTTP protocols. So all of these things um, are basically the gist also of the, um, of the decision tree that I was showing earlier in one of the slides. And this is where um, we will be going through now um, as, part of this doc uh, as part of this presentation. So let's go through it one by one. The first one is about you're not able or you might not be allowed to connect your device to the Wi-Fi network. So the usual setup for your mobile test will be very similar to this. So you have your iOS device, you have your laptop with Burp or another interception proxy running, and of course, your M access point. So the testing device and your laptop are in the same wireless network, and through the proxy setting on your iOS device, you redirect the traffic um, through Burp. So I had several locations in the past where this setup was now not working for me. So when you go on site, you might experience the following scenarios and maybe also limiting factors. So you might not be able to use your jailbroken device because you might violate the customer's policy by bringing in a potential vulnerable device into the client's network. It's rooted, all of the security controls can of course be bypassed, and therefore this might something um, that might not be allowed because of a policy. Then another technical um, problem might be that there's client isolation activated in the Wi-Fi network. So this means your iOS device and your laptop are not able to communicate with each other. And you're only allowed to talk to the um, access point, the gateway, but not to the other devices in the Wi-Fi network. So the interception is therefore not possible. And believe it or not, one time I also had a scenario where I, would, uh, where I wanted to connect uh, to a Wi-Fi with my laptop, it was still working, but then the Wi-Fi was full and we reached the limit and I couldn't connect my iOS device anymore. Of course, very much of an edge case, but um, all of these things might be limiting factors and you would still need to find a way to test. So what can we do now in order to intercept still the traffic, even though that we will not be able to intercept it in the Wi-Fi? So as long as you have a jailbroken device, there's a trick by simply using a secutional tunnel and um, port forwarding. So the prerequisites are that you connect your iOS device via USB to your Mac in this case. Once you have done that, you can um, secure shell into your iOS device by using iProxy and also secure shell. iProxy is already a very old tool that is basically opening a SOX proxy and which was being used a long time back to simply do tethering via your um, iOS device. But um, you can see here on the screenshot on the right side, I'm using iProxy to open um, the port four times two locally on my Mac, which is then being for, uh, forwarded to port 22 on the iOS device, which is where the secure shell server is running. In the bottom, you can see now um, the secure shell command that I'm executing. So this means that um, the dash capital R is being used for remote port forwarding. And this means it's forwarding all connection attempts to the source port 8080, which is marked in orange here to the remote purple port 8080 on the Mac's local host, which is marked in green. So this allows now the iOS device to connect to port 8080 on local host, which will then be tunneled through um, secure shell and makes a TCP connection to port 8080 on your laptop where your burp is running. So um, with this scenario, it's now really possible to test um, via USB and not through the Wi-Fi anymore. So the, once you have the secure shell tunnel, 
up and running, the only thing that you would need to do is to reconfigure the proxy settings on your iOS device. So there's no, no need anymore to um, use the external um, IP address. You just need to open the settings of your Wi-Fi and you click um, on configure proxy, configure the local host, port 8080, and then all the traffic, um, all the HTTP traffic is now being routed through this proxy that is set to local host and is going through the USB communication now. So the really nice thing is now that you can be connected literally to any Wi-Fi because you're anyway not routing the traffic through Wi-Fi. The traffic will now be um, going directly through the USB connection. Um, so once you have done a secure shell port forwarding, you will see here localhost port 8080 that I opened um, on a test iPad, and you can see I have access now to Burp Suite. So let me show you a quick demo also around this. On the left side, you can see my um, terminal on my MacBook, and on the right side, you can see my jailbroken um, iPhone 6S. So I'm executing iProxy. You can see um, port to, uh, four times two, which is the port that will be opened on my Mac. And with the secure shell command, I'm connecting now through this port to the secure shell server on my um, iPhone device. And I'm doing the remote port forwarding now of port 8080. So I'm doing executing the command. I put in my password and you can see I'm authenticated now via secure shell on the right side. I'm checking now if I can access now port um, 8080 on localhost, and you can see it's working. So the next thing that I would need to do is I would need to go into the settings of my Wi-Fi. I reconfigure the proxy. In this case, it was already done. And if I open now Safari, you can see that all the requests will now um, be ending up directly in Burp. So even though that they cannot communicate on the Wi-Fi to each other, it is possible now to test through the USB connection by using um, the secure shell remote port for warning. And here you can see the um, HTTP requests that are coming in, and you can see the user agent that it's coming um, from my iPhone. Okay, so this is the case where you might not be able to intercept um, communication within a Wi-Fi. And um, it is also possible to test in this scenario with a jailbroken iOS device through a secure shell tunnel. So this was one edge case that you might be facing. Another one is um, where the system proxy might be ignored by the app. So there are a lot of different alternative mobile app development frameworks and also tool chains that allow you to use a different programming language. Um, than is offered by iOS. If you produce an iOS native binary, an iOS app, then you would rely on Xcode and you would be using Objective-C and Swift. But there are a lot of frameworks available that allow developers to produce almost the same binaries as the official tools, but they would um, allow you to create an iOS app, but also an Android app. So therefore, these kind, uh, these kind of frameworks might be Flutter, which is um, from Google, and the programming language is Dart for this. Then we have um, React Native, which is uh, or was open source by Facebook in 2015. And this allows you also to create native apps, but out of JavaScript. Last but not least, there's also Xamarin, which was um, bought by Microsoft um, a few years back. And you can build mobile apps by using um, C Sharp. So all of the frameworks have one thing in common. You can create native apps for each platform by just using one framework and one programming language, which makes, of course, the development a bit easier instead of using Xcode for iOS and Android Studio for Android. So therefore, the frameworks are also um, becoming um, quite popular. The thing is now that some of these frameworks are ignoring the system proxy. So this is just um, a subset of all the frameworks that are available. There are, of course, many more. Um, for Flutter, it's bypassing the system proxy. So if you are testing an app that is developed um, with, the Google, with Google Flutter, 
then you will not be able to easily um, intercept the network communication. And the same applies also to summary maps. For React Native, um, this is not an issue. You will be able to um, intercept the HTTP calls easily. But if you have something in Flutter or summary, we again have some a case um, where we would need to intercept the network traffic in a different way. So just to show you how this will look like, um, I set up here um, the proxy. This time it's via um, the external IP address of my MacBook as they are communicating in the same Wi-Fi network. And I'm doing the request in Safari and you can see the request to example.com is ending up in the interception proxy. So the proxy is working. So I have now here a mobile app that I built in Flutter, just a test app that is triggering an HTTP and HTTPS request. So you might have seen that I clicked it actually, but no request is ending up in the interception proxy in our burp suite. So now we need to find a way to intercept um, the network communication in this scenario where Google Flutter is being used. So we know now that the Wi-Fi settings will have no effect for Flutter and also for Xamarin. So what can we do now? Um, there are, of course, different solutions to this, to this challenge. So one thing would be to use R poisoning. So we can attack on layer two by using a better cap, for example. This might be one viable option. Another thing is to use um, DNS spoofing by using the no proxy, which is a plugin for Burp that would allow you to start your own DNS server um, within Burp suite. So both would be working, of course, on non-jailbroken and jailbroken devices because we would be attacking on the network layer um, in, in, in this scenario. So therefore, um, we, can, we could even execute this on non-jailbroken devices. So the Nope Burp plugin um, adds two new features to Burp Suite. So as I was saying, one is the configurable DNS server, and the other one is the non-HTTP man-in-the-middle interception proxy. So this is then another feature which we will be discussing um, later on. So you can see here again the scenario in this, but this time we will not um, be intercepting via the proxy. As we know, it's not working. So we will be using um, the DNS server that comes with the NOPE extension and Burp suite. We will be configuring the DNS server in the mobile device, and then we will be um, able to intercept all the DNS-based traffic. Okay, so again, a demo, Burp on the left side, on the right side, you can see my um, iPhone. The proxy is configured. So it's listening on all interfaces. So you can see it's the same IP address. And um, again, I'm doing a reload of the example.com website in Safari, and you can see the request is being captured um, in Burp. So again, we're testing the um, Flutter app with the HTTP and HTTPS request, which is not working. So we cannot see the request. So what we're doing next is I already um, installed the no proxy app extension is we are starting now the DNS server. So you can see the huge uh, green button on the top left side. So this is basically how you start the DNS server. You only need to um, select the proper interface so that um, the DNS server is bound to the right um, interface that you want to use. So in this case, um, it's um, EN7. And this is where the DNS server is now being started. So now I'm getting rid of the proxy configuration. So I'm simply saying proxy off. And instead of the proxy, I'm configuring now the DNS server. So I'm going into the DNS settings. I'm removing the default settings that I got from the Wi-Fi. And I'm simply putting in now the DNS server from um, that is running on my MacBook and the IP address. I'm testing again if it's actually working with Safari in this, in this, this time now. I am. First, I would need to add here on the bottom, um, you can see add 80 and 443. So with this button, two listeners will be added to um, Burp. So we have two more listeners, which is port 80 and 443, and they are in visible mode because we're not using a proxy anymore. And the DNS is now resolving to our IP address. We will be getting port 80 and 443. And now you can see when I click on HTTP request, the request is now coming in. 
and also the HTTPS request is now coming in. So because we have these two listeners now um, running in Burp and the DNS is now resolving to our IP address, we're getting now all the DNS-based traffic, as you can see very easily. So there are, of course, a lot of other possible solutions. Um, just want to give you um, a quick overview around this. If you have a jailbroken device and it would only be one domain, uh, what you can also do is configure the ETC hosts on your jailbroken iOS device. This would be one viable option. Then you would still need to add port 80 and 443 as an um, invisible um, listener so that you're able to intercept also um, the network communication. Otherwise, um, you can set up also an access point. This would also be one way. So we have a quite um, good and detailed explanation around this in the mobile security testing guide. So therefore, I'm just referring to this link if you want to set up your own access point with the goal to intercept also all the traffic. So to summarize it now, um, ideally, I would say DNS spoofing is a quite nice way um, of intercepting the traffic because you have the control of it within Burp. And you also do not need to have a jailbroken device. The only problem with this is that it's only the traffic based on DNS. So if there might be any traffic that might be going to an IP, of course, then this is something um, that you wouldn't be able to capture in the scenario. But otherwise, um, it's a very um, good way of intercepting um, also the traffic of, um, of Google Flutter apps. If you want to capture then all the traffic, then of course, things like BetterCap where you do R poisoning is then of course also an option. There is, of course, more. I mean, you can also set up your own VPN server, of course, to get all the traffic. So there's a lot of different things that can be done in order to tackle this problem. One more thing is now intercepting non-HTTP traffic. So if everything is set up correctly, you are able to intercept HTTP, HTTPS requests in Safari, and you might still not see all the traffic in Burp Suite from your mobile app, this can have several reasons. So the protocols that are used in a mobile app might be simply non-HTTP. So this can be one thing, maybe also different ports are being used than the usual ports for port 80 for HTTP and 443 for HTTPS. And the thing is interception proxies such as Burp or also OWASP ZAP will not show you non-HTTP traffic because they aren't capable of decoding such protocols by default. And they will also not help you out of the box um, if you need to test non-HTTP. So Burp will help you for testing web sockets, HTTP, everything that is HTTP based, but of course not out of the box for other protocols. So to give you a few examples in mobile apps, um, some have built-in chat functions for support or for other reasons, and this can then rely on XMPP. Then some apps are relying on raw TCP to communicate something. And this is usually also done to reduce the overhead that is being generated by HTTP headers and also other dependencies of the protocol and TCP might therefore be a lightweight alternative. So if you're facing such a case and you still cannot see the traffic from the app, even though that you have, um, for example, better cap running, also DNS spoofing, you really want to monitor now and analyze the network traffic first so that you can decide what to do next. For iOS, it doesn't let you record a packet trace directly, but you can use your Mac, um, meaning a Mac OS device, um, to record a packet trace of an attached iOS device. Um, by using the so-called remote virtual interface or RVI. So the RVI is very similar to a network tab. And this will mirror then all the network packets of the iOS device to a virtual interface on your Mac. So this is really also only possible on Mac OS. So there's um, an open source implementation of RVI CTL for Linux. But um, this is not working anymore, I think, since iOS 12. Therefore, this approach that I'm sharing now is only working if you have a macOS device available where you can plug in your iOS device via USB. So 
After you have connected the iOS device via USB, you would need to identify the UDID, meaning the unique identifier of the iOS device. And this you can do with this command, ICSI run, ICSI trace list devices, which will give you an overview about all the connected devices, but also all the simulators. So this um, might become a bit of a larger list, but uh, the first ones will be the um, actual hardware devices that are connected to your Mac. Afterwards, once you know the UDID, you can execute a command just via RVICTL-S, then the UDID, and then the virtual um, int network interface will be started, which is then called RVI0, if it's then the first one. As a next step, you simply start Wireshark with um, looking into the RVI0 um, interface, and you will be able to capture now all the packets. I also prepared a demo for this. So again, on the left side, you can see my MacBook. On the right side, my um, jailbroken iOS device. And with the command, you can see um, this is the UDID and the only information that I need now. So with RVICTL, there are only three different flags. And the one that we are interested in is now dash S to start a device or a set of devices. So we say RVICTL dash S UDID, and we have now a new virtual interface called RVI0. And once we have this, I'm first I'm verifying with ifconfig this new interface. And now with Wireshark, I'm just um, looking at this interface. Wireshark is starting now immediately with the dash K. And you can see that all the packets that are being network packets that are being generated on the iOS device, I can see now in my Wireshark. So I'm just making an HTTP call by opening Safari, and you can see there's no HTTP and TLS, so the communication is now ongoing, and I can monitor now the traffic. So if you have a Mac available, this is a very nice um, way of how you can get a full network capture um, of the network traffic that is happening on the iOS device. And you can do it I'm in mean, real time. So there's no need now to um, do a PCAP file on the iOS device and copy it out and then analyze it and open it then in Wireshark. So with this approach, you have it in real time, which is, of course, always much more handy. So I was saying at the beginning, it's mainly about iOS, but um, I want to share a similar approach also for Android, because I think it's also very important to simply understand how you can also do these kind of real-time analysis also on Android. Um, so you can sniff remotely also all the Android traffic by using TCP dump on the phone, then piping everything through NetCut, and again, opening it then in Wireshark. So you just need to execute this command on your Android device by using TCP dump on the interface that you want to um, monitor. And in this case, with the dash at the end, um, we are writing everything to STD out and piping it then through NetCut, in this case to port five times one. And then um, on our laptop, or in this case on my Mac, I'm using the command ADB forward. So ADB is the so-called um, Android debug bridge which is one of the default tools that comes um, when you're installing also Android Studio. So it's a developer tool also. And what I'm doing is in the screenshot below is ADB forward. So I'm forwarding the port five times two, uh, five times one from my Android device to my Mac. And then I'm starting NetCut on this port that was being forwarded and I'm piping it to, uh, to Wireshark. And again, I can see all the traffic um, also in real time in the scenario. There's also more detailed explanation in the uh, mobile security testing guide. You can see the link here on the bottom right. So also for this, I have a quick um, demo. So in this case, I'm having an emulator running on the right side and I'm doing ADB shell to simply um, shell into um, the emulated Android device. I'm executing now the TCP dump command and I'm piping everything through NetCut and port five times one is now being opened and available on the device. I'm doing now the ADB forward to forward the port from the emulated device to my laptop. 
And on my laptop, I'm executing netcast, netcut to connect to the port that we just forwarded and piping everything now um, to Wireshark. And then again, I'm having a quite neat and nice way to get um, a real-time um, analysis or can do a real-time analysis for the network um, communication. So you can see I'm doing example.com, going to this, and I can, of course, now rely on all the um, display filters that are being available in Wireshark and search for the protocols. And it should therefore be very easy to identify now the right um, traffic that was being generated also from the mobile app. So just a few tips if you're using this um, scenario, if you need to identify non-HTTP traffic, of course, close all the apps in the background, sim in the background simply to reduce um, noise in terms of packets that might otherwise be showing up um, in Wireshark, um, then it should be pretty easy to identify the IP addresses of the server the app is communicating with. And then you can very easily filter also further. So if you know the IP address, you simply le uh, leverage on the um, display filter um, from Wireshark. And of course, you can follow the TCP stream so that you have access to really the um, communication, to the whole communication of a specific packet that you might find interesting. And once you have this, you should be able to answer the two questions, which should be which protocol is now actually being used and if this traffic is now encrypted or not. So again, we have now the same setup as before. The only thing that we would need to add now is a listener to the port that the app might be communicating with it's, if it's not port 80 or 443. So let me show you how this can be done. So here in this scenario, I already have um, Wireshark up and running and I have a test iOS app created that is sending TC, a TCP request. So I just press the request to button and you can see in the lower, uh, the last five packets, first there's the TCP handshake, ag, uh, ag, push, ag, ag, and then something is being sent to port 31337. So therefore, this is a pure TCP connection that you will not be able to see um, in, um, in, in your bird, for example. So now we know there's a TCP connection ongoing or TCP traffic, and it's going to the port 31337. The next question is, of course, now how we can intercept this now in Burr. So here I have again um, a short demo. And what we are doing now is our DNS server is up and running. So you can see the packets are coming in. We're again going to example.com and everything is working. So in the no proxy, we have also a tab with DNS history. So when I'm clicking now on request two, the request is of course going through it, the DNS request. And you can see that this is the domain the app is communicating with. So what I can do now is in the bottom here in the non-HTTP proxy settings, I put in the server address and the server port. The server port we already know because of the Wireshark monitoring that we did earlier. And we can add now this listener, we enable this listener, and the next thing that we will be doing is we go into the TCP intercept in the nope proxy and um, we set intercept is on. I click again on the request to button and you can see that this time we are able to intercept now um, even a TCP um, packet. And this is now the response. So it's just a simple TCP echo server that is just reversing whatever you're sending to the server, you get um, the reversed string back. So therefore the request is user colon administrator and password, you got me. And then the response and the string is basically just reversed. But with this um, setup, you will be able to intercept even all um, protocols if they are not um, HTTP. Okay, so as summary for intercepting non-HTTP traffic, um, the very first thing should be to use RVICTL for iOS because it really helps us to trace and monitor all the network requests that are coming from the iOS device. 
Um, for Android, TCP dump it can be your friend. And at the end of the day, you want to use Wireshark, of course, to really have this um, real-time or the possibility of doing real-time analysis um, of all the network traffic. And with the Nope extension, this is quite a um, quite good way in order to intercept and also analyze um, protocols further that are not based on HTTP. Okay, so um, we already come now to the end of my presentation for today. And um, there's a QR code here on the right side where you can download the slide deck that I just shared today. Also here the bit.ly link to make it a bit shorter. Um, the key takeaways for today is intercepting the network communication can be straightforward, but there are sometimes edge cases. And the no proxy is a quite nice and also easy way in order to intercept network communication. And if you are struggling in order to intercept um, traffic, you definitely should have a look at what is actually going on on the iOS or Android device and to monitor also this traffic to see the protocols and if it's encrypted or not. Um, as this was, of course, only a short talk today, we cannot cover now all the different edge cases. So one additional thing that I didn't cover today that you might still need to tackle is SSL pinning, of course. So even if you're now able to intercept um, a Flutter app, there might still be SSL pinning implemented. The thing is for Flutter app, it's also a bit more tricky because the Flutter app has their own trust store also. So therefore the usual um, Frida scripts will not working out of the box. So if you need to bypass them, there's a quite nice write-up um, from company in Viso. They have summarized their way with a lot of technical details and also sample Frida scripts of how you can intercept then also um, SSL pinning and Flutter apps. Otherwise, they also have a really nice um, overview about common issues and also um, a checklist for proxying Android app traffic, which should be very helpful and helpful in case you're facing any issues during the whole process. Okay. That's it from my side. So um, I hope you all uh, learned something new from the talk. Otherwise, um, I think we can jump into the Q&A if there are any other questions. And yeah, thank you all for attending the session today. Thank you very much, Sven. A very interesting um, presentation there. And um, I am sure our attendees have learned quite a, quite a bit there. So as Sven said, if you've got any questions around the presentation or anything else that you're thinking about whilst you've been watching that, then please feel free to type those questions into the question pane. Now, we do have a couple of questions that have already come in. So um, the first one I'd like to ask you is, how can one get started into mobile app testing or sharpen their skills if they have started um, within this? Okay, sure. Um, so the thing is, as part of the OVAS Mobile Security Testing Guide project, we do have um, quite a bit of different Android and iOS apps that um, will definitely help in order to get started, especially with reverse engineering and also to get, um, get, get the setup right and try to bypass some of the security controls like root detection, anti-debugging, all of these things. So um, one way is to simply go to the mobile security testing guide GitHub repo and there are the so-called crack me's. That's a summary of, of these different um, mobile apps that we created. If you're not that um, experienced yet in reverse engineering, then this is also not an issue because a lot of people have already solved um, the challenges also. So we have quite a few nice write-ups. So it's definitely worth to maybe go through the write-ups first, see if you can um, do this by yourself with these step-by-step -step instructions. And then um, we also have the mobile uh, hacking playground, which is another GitHub repo. And I would simply go through these kind of vulnerable mobile applications. And once you are more experienced and tackle maybe specific issues, then I would simply um, say, go to the mobile security testing guide. And um, there's usually a lot of um, test cases of how you can verify um, specific problems, like for example, how to bypass SSL pinning, and that should be able to help them. So, yes. 
Oh, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so moving on to the next question, um, what is your usual approach if a client has implemented a mature provider of a, an SDK that might make testing a mobile apps challenging, such as um, jailbreak detection, anti-bugging um, and other, other things? Okay, so especially when we're testing in regulated environments like um, banks, then there might be a lot of um, these kind of SDKs available that might make the testing quite um, problematic also. So the thing is always it depends on what the client actually wants to achieve. So if the client is already quite mature, then it might make sense to do um, a black box assessment and see if the controls in the app are actually stopping reverse engineers and are really producing a lot of overhead and to test the resiliency of these kind of controls. But this is, I would say, again, maybe a bit of an edge case and more for mature clients. Um, otherwise, um, the approach should always be that um, to request for two different builds of an app. So this means one build where all the controls like root detection, jailbreak detection, SSL pinning is simply disabled so that you can dive directly into testing the business logic and can test the APIs for different kind of injection attacks and of course to test the authentication authorization. And then still with um, a production build of the app where everything is simply enforced, we can do some sanity check if it's quite easy with um, objection, which is a quite um, mature tool for, for mobile app testing, or also for reader scripts if it's easily possible to bypass some of the um, security controls. So to summarize, get two different um, builds of the app, one debug build where everything is disabled ideally, so we can easily test the APIs, and one production build to just see what kind of security controls are implemented and if they can easily be bypassed. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, moving on to the next question, um, how viable is patching a non-native application to capture traffic? Um, okay, so at the end of the day, it really depends a little bit on the framework. So the thing is, um, there might be frameworks that are simply relying on web views. So if that's the case, it might be very unlikely that you will see something that is non-HTTP. But um, the thing is, usually, this is a bit of an edge case that, that I could see in some applications, but in non-native, okay, the thing is, native Applications would be something that we would consider um, that is being built from iOS and Android directly through their tool chain. If you're using frameworks like Google Flutter, they would also be native applications. But the thing is, um, there can definitely be some also non-HTTP communication in them. This, this could simply be defined. If you're talking now purely about frameworks that are only relying on web views, so you have like your native app, but inside it's only web views, then um, the communication should only be going through port 80 or 443. I hope that answers the question, Matty. Lovely. Thank you. As, as I say, if, if there is any other parts to the question, then please type it into the chat or the question pane um, and we can follow those ones up for you. So is it possible to modify non-HTTP traffic um, using Note Proxy when testing mobile application? Uh, yes, yes. So you can also um, modify. So it's, it's intercepting um, the request that is happening. So therefore, it's also possible um, to modify the traffic then. Great. That's wonderful. So I don't know if anybody else has got any other questions. Please feel free to type them in the pane now and we can we can get those asked for you. Um, if not, um, please feel free to um, type anything over to us at marketing at um, crest-approved.org and we can always pass those on to Sven. As I say, is you've got the QR code there to download the slide deck. So um, please feel free and we will have the recording coming out shortly after today's presentations. Um, so it doesn't look like we've got any other questions that are coming in. Um, uh, Maddie, I think there is actually one more from Maddie I've just seen here in the chat. Oh. Um, how viable is it to patch non-native applications to capture traffic? For example, adding a proxy to a Xamarin app 
with DNS by, if possible, or React Native if Reader doesn't necessarily work. Um, okay, so that's also one way. So this depends a little bit of how um, good the developer can simply turn this around and put this actually also um, into the app for us. Otherwise, I think using, um, for example, better cap or um, using the no proxy might always be a good option because then it's at least in our control. But to patch, uh, okay, um, in order to patch the app from our end, I think that the easiest would be to use better cap and also um, and also the no proxy plugin. To be honest, I, I know that this is possible, but I haven't tried it yet to patch it on our end. That's lovely. Thank you. Hopefully that, that answers what you need, Matty, but please um, feel free to type in. Um, we still have, well, we've just ended our time really, but I'm sure if you've got a couple of things to follow up, then you can do. Um, and as I say, please feel free to type them through at marketing at crest-approved. Org. Um, I want to say a really big thank you to Sven for um, this presentation today. Um, excellent um, information that I'm sure all the attendees have enjoyed. Um, and thank you so much, Sven, for joining us um, at Crestcon Asia. It's really appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you, Crest, for the invite. And thank you all the attendees for joining today. Then have a great day and hope to see you soon again.